Okay. Hey guys, um, welcome and thanks for being here for the first in the Emerging Practice Lecture Series um, hosted by the Caribbean Architectural Student Association at the Caribbean School of Architecture. I know we find ourselves in very unfortunate times where working and living have become precarious. We have to distance ourselves from colleagues and loved ones. And I know this may have affected each of your lives and practice in its own way. I hope we can take advantage of this new normal in a digital space to reach across the colonial man-made boundaries to convene as a Caribbean community. It is in that spirit that we introduce the Emerging Practice Lecture Series. This series aims to give insights to students as well as practicing professionals about the realities of starting and maintaining an architectural practice. Each of our speakers in this series has a story that led them to start and it motivates them to continue practicing architecture. Uh, we also want to highlight their work as emerging voices in Caribbean architecture to the academic and professional community. And most important of all, we want to strengthen the networks the networks across the Caribbean architectural community regionally and globally, and create these bridges between practitioners and students, um, academia and the professional environment. Um, so the thesis for the series is that practicing architecture in the Caribbean comes with its unique challenges, and even more so for young officers. How do young architects navigate post-colonial regulatory environments and work within available resources to create meaningful work. Um, so I want to say I really appreciate Irina for joining us today and kicking off the series. It's really a pleasure to introduce her. Irina Koska is the principal and managing director of IK Architecture, born and raised on the island of Grenada. She sees herself as a conceptual designer who thinks outside of the box, pushing the bar on design and innovation. Her professional training, which included studies in both Germany and Australia, focused on both culture and architecture. It gives her the insight needed to guide clients on various architectural trends, cultural references, and designs that enhance the built environment and our way of life. Inspired by culture, art, and travel, Irina has built an architecture firm for the visionary investor, a team of forward-thinking creatives whose design philosophy is guided by their commitment to creating innovative designs that celebrates the cohesion between the natural and the built environment. Um, thank you a lot, Irina, for um, joining us and agreeing to do this. Um, and with that, I'll turn it over to you. Thank you very much, Jordan, for having me. Um, thank you to everybody else for joining in. I really appreciate this, um, the gesture of the invitation. And I really lo I'm looking forward to presenting our office. Um, I say ours because I, I see it as ours and not just mine. I will be introducing the team a little later on. So you'll see, um, you'll see everyone. Um, so I think I'll just get started. Next slide. As you can see, this is me. <laughs> um, what I'll be going through, I'll be telling you a little bit about me then going in on the firm, the architecture firm. Then I'll feature one commercial project that we've done, a renovation project and a new build. Um, after that, I'll be going in on a couple of the challenges that we've met, um, particularly within the last year. You'll see why within the last year. Next slide. So, um, yeah, as mentioned, my name is Irina Koska. I was born on the island of Grenada. I was raised here, but I studied in Germany at the Leibniz University. Um, Germany, because I'm half German, my mother is German, so I grew up speaking German. And when I was getting ready to go to university and seeing all the school fees in England and in the US and where, wherever, um, I decided to do Germany, even though my German writing skills weren't that amazing, um, but tuition in Germany is non-existent. It was, they had tuition fees when I went to university, but it was quite minimal in comparison 
So that's why I bit the bullet and went to Germany, which turned out to be a good decision. Um, I studied there within that time. I went to Australia for one semester just because I wanted um, to be in an environment that builds for a warmer climate. You know, in Germany, it's cold most of the time. And I wanted to, to learn how to design for sun and getting breeze into a building rather than trying to keep it out all the time. Um, I also interned at a company called Graft in Berlin. They're quite cool. I would um, tell everyone to check them out, G-A-R-F-T. Um, right after studying, I came back to Grenada almost immediately because I missed home too much. It's as easy as that. And I worked with Coco. They're also a really good architecture firm based here in Grenada. They do amazing, very sculptural work. Um, but I didn't work with them for a long period of time because they didn't have that many projects at, going at that time. So I more or less started freelancing. Um, next slide, please. So this, I'm just gonna, I just made a collage of the work that was done while I was freelancing. There are a couple of built projects um, and how these projects came about. Thankfully, Grenada is a small island and you know somebody, everybody knows somebody. My first project, which is the top left project, was actually um, my best friend's brother who wanted a house built. So I started designing it while I was still at university. Um, the design right in the middle, this is my mother's house. So she actually waited for me to finish architecture school. And we, um, we built a, a, a building with four apartments, two of which we rent out as Airbnbs. She lives in one, I live in another one. And the others really are, you know somebody, somebody knows somebody else, and that's how I was, I was recommended. I honestly didn't do much marketing, um, and I didn't take myself too seriously, if I'm, if I'm being honest. Next slide. So in 2017, end of 2017, beginning of 2018, I moved to Cape Town. Just because um, coming out of architecture school, I started freelancing almost immediately and never worked in a firm. So I decided, I felt like I needed that. So I decided um, to get out of Grenada. I didn't want to go anywhere cold. And um, I had a friend or I have a few friends in Cape Town who are architects. And in looking at what Cape Town looks like, you know, I'm, I'm very much into nature. So, and having a balanced life. It's not always about work for me. So I decided to move to Cape Town and I found employment with a firm called Design Space Africa. They're actually one of three or four black owned um, firms in Cape Town. Most of the architecture firms are white owned. I'm sure everybody knows the history of South Africa with apartheid and Cape Town, despite it being about 20, odd years, 26 years or so since apartheid ended, it is, the remnants of it are, is, you know, they're still pre prevalent there. Johannesburg is a bit different, but um, in Cape Town, you do sense a bit of a divide. Anyways, um, 2020, I decided to move back to Grenada, and that's when I decided, right, it's time to, to, to do it properly. So I started a firm, IK Architecture, and um, now I'm gonna tell you a bit about that. Next slide. So this is one of our projects. Next slide. Um, I'm gonna start with our positioning statement. In deciding to take myself a bit more serious and take the work that is done more serious um, for, the, for the firm, I had, um, brand identity development done in preparation for website development, et cetera. And um, the positioning statement of the company in thinking about where do we stand and what, what are we aiming to do, um, a positioning statement was developed and I'll just read it out. IK Architecture is a firm for forward thinking investors inspired by culture, art and travel, well poised to guide clients on global trends the designs aim to be ahead of their time while, en while enhancing the built environment. Next slide. 
So this is the team that we have. Um, everybody's actually here in the office um, listening in live. And um, I'll go from left to right and introduce everybody. On the left is Anisha. She actually went to UTech as well. Um, so Jordan, she knows you. And um, Anisha is one of the senior members of the firm. She's a project architect. Usually she um, runs with the project. Anisha actually also does her own work on the side, which I don't have a problem with. I actually think, it, think it's quite good. Um, next to me is Antonia. She's the baby of the firm and we keep reminding her of it. She's an architectural technician and the only gentleman in the firm is Trevor and we, we don't let him um, live. <laughs> <laughs> um, he's actually from Dominica. He studied in Morocco and he, he brings the masculinity to the office and makes sure we don't get away with too much gossip and girl talk. Um, yeah. And me, I am um, the managing director, but to be honest, because it's such a small team, you do realize very quickly that in running a firm, um, an architecture firm really and truly you have so many different roles and a lot of the time sitting down and working on projects yourself almost never happens just because you have to support everybody else you have to look to see what everybody else is doing talk through projects do corrections you have to make sure the toilet has toilet rolls and the kitchen has coffee and tea and um consulting with clients and going to sites and meetings and so on. So it's really, you know, across the board, almost doing everything. Next slide. So our vision is to enhance the built environment in the Caribbean, incorporating the fascinating culture, rich history and characteristics of the islands. We pave the way for more immersive architecture that breathes new life and opportunity into our economy. And um, I include economy here, uh, you know, as architects, we, get, we can get lost in the art of it, but we have to remember, especially with commercial projects, that at the end of the day, the client wants to make money. So, and we have to advise them on how to, how to have a building that will make them money. And that also includes the psychology of human beings and knowing how human beings operate, what makes them spend money, et cetera. Um, our purpose, we live for designs that stand out. We are visionaries who love and live for good designs that bring the wow factor. We are here to make a difference, not just in Grenada, but across the Caribbean. Next, please. So um, I'll introduce our first commercial project. And um, as I stated before, the firm has only been functioning for a year. In August, it was a year. So most of the, pro actually all the projects that have been done under IK Architecture are unbuilt. They're all conceptual. We're actually putting in the third, the third project for planning approval. So fingers crossed within the next few months, we'll be building. Um, this commercial, the aim of this project was to design an innovative and contemporary supermarket suited to the Caribbean climate and context, creating a new approach to commercial developments in Grenada through careful planning and integrated design. Next slide. So this site is actually located in the vicinity of the second largest town in Grenada, what in Grenada you will call the countryside. So there aren't many developments of this nature um, in that area. And the cooperative which um, assigned us to design the building, you know, I think initially they were thinking quite simple and I had to, you know, say, come on, you know, we, we're gonna get people to get come to this area just through the architecture. This is how you're gonna make money, et cetera. So um, from the firm side, it was really showing them that it doesn't have to be simple. You know, you want to maximize your um, walk-ins to make the most of it. Next, please. This just shows the location of the project. This is the town called Brenville and then the site location. Next. 
the site itself has uh, is sort of shaped like an amphitheater. So um, you'll see the road on the left. And then from the road, it goes down 14 feet to a very flat area. And then it goes up 30 feet again. And then you have a bit of a plateau. So in response to this, oh, I should have mentioned there's actually also a gas station um, component to the supermarket. So what we did was create a platform rather than backfilling. We created a platform on the same level as the road and the gas station will be located on that level. And then the supermarket would be on two levels um, and the parking behind the supermarket. Next. So this is a sort of a site plan of the project. You'll see along the road, that little symbol that we incorporated a bus stop as well. Um, but also alongside the parking area, there's another bus stop. And this is something that um, buildings in the Caribbean don't often think about, you know, pedestrian traffic. We always think about vehicular traffic, but we wanted this building to be accessible to everyone. So buses can stop alongside the main road, but they can also drive in front of the supermarket to pick up um, customers who may have lots of shopping bags, you know, granny and, and so on. Um, so access to the gas station, the gas station is right at the front. You enter on one side, you get your gas, you exit on the other side. And there would also be areas to charge if you have an um, electric vehicle. Next. This just shows how private vehicles would enter the site. So they enter on one side, drive down to the flat area, they would park and to exit, they would go up the back area. Next. On the top level, so this is the same level as the gas station, we have the offices for the supermarket. So inclusive of their offices, they also wanted a boardroom and a conference room. Also, uh, the conference room can be used to rent out because in that area, there's nothing of that sort. So if there are any meetings or galas, it could be rented out for that purpose. On the first floor, there would also be a mini mart. So anybody who's going to the gas station, they just quickly want to get a drink, they could go to the mini mart. Um, also utility and storage for the supermarket and also the big white area, that's now offices which can also be rented out. Next. On the ground floor, um, which is accessible from the parking area is a large supermarket with um, storage space, supermarket prep area, and you know, back of house areas for staff, toilets, um, break room, et cetera. Next. So, this is how the site looks at the moment. And in thinking about the facade for the building, we really didn't want it to seem very alien to the area because the area is quite simple. And um, we looked to the site for inspiration because it is a very green area. It's the agricultural parish of Grenada. And um, next, the next slide will explain a bit more. We wanted to mimic sort of that feeling you would get when you're in a rainforest um, where the, the rainforest and the foliage provides protection from the harsh weather conditions. You know, it lets in sunlight, but not too much. Um, it protects you from the wind and a little bit from the rain as well. So this is what we wanted to, to this was really our inspiration for the facade. Next. So we looked at different buildings that had facades that kind of, um, you know, mimic this. Um, we looked at that strong verticality and using timber-like facade, um, which it, we definitely won't be using actual timber, but um, either aluminum, which looks like timber or um, composite timber because the timber just won't last in our climate. You know, it will bleach out and the rain will get to it and then the termites will come and you can get very hard wood and it still won't last. Whereas the composite or the aluminum will last quite a long time. Next, please. So I'll just, you can just go through the slides. Um, this is the front. So the entrance to the supermarket from the parking area. Next. 
This is the view from the road. So you can see the supermarket and then the mini mart has an entrance. And from this level, um, there's a pedestrian walkway down to the parking area, but also in, you'll see in that area where there's a guy standing there, looks like he's on his phone. You can also, um, there are stairs to go down to the lower level from there. Next. This view shows the bus stop and the loading bay. So that's the, the back of house where um, trucks would load, load off all the groceries. Next. And this is so the shows the entrance again and the stairs that would lead you up to the top area. Next. So I'll, the next project I'll go through is a renovation project. Um, it's this house, it doesn't look like this as yet. I'll show you images of what it currently looks like, but it sits in a residential area in Grenada, beautiful, with beautiful views. And unfortunately the existing building doesn't take in those views. Um, and um, we, the client really, he's, He's a, an older gentleman who likes to entertain and it, the house just didn't have any space for that and didn't reflect his lifestyle as such. Next. So this is what the house looks like currently. As you can see, it's, it's just a, a rectangle. It's very closed off. There are um, hardly any outside spaces, particularly none that take in the view. Next. Um, more views of the current building. There's a pool area at the back, um, which is quite nice, but you know, it's, it's not really maximized. The space isn't really maximized in its use. Next. So this is the current floor plan. A driveway leads into a garage and the basement, and that leads into a large storage multifunctional space, which has everything, washing machines, but also tools for um, working on cars, etc. Next. Um, this is what we changed it to. So we still left the garage. Um, from the garage, you have a designated workshop and you have a designated um, laundry space. There's also now a studio part, well, a one bedroom apartment on the ground floor, which is accessed from the outside in the covered deck area. So we have an open plan living space with kitchen. Um, we have a bedroom and we have a separate bathroom. Next. The first floor um, is above the level I just showed. It's accessible through those stairs. Um, you enter into a covered deck space, which can seem a bit dark and the, it's currently not really used much. Um, you enter into the house, you go into the living room, kitchen, and then there are two bedrooms, both of which are en suite. Um, one has a smaller bedroom and the client wanted an extra bedroom and a, a veranda extension towards the, um, the top area. It's not exactly north, but the top area of the site. Um, next. So as you can see, I've highlighted the additions that we've done and we did a few changes. We made a few changes to the floor plan. So we added a master bedroom with walk-in closet and ensuite, and we added a veranda. Um, we did not connect them because we wanted the facade to have quite a bit of play. Um, we felt like if we connected them, we were just continuing that very straight, linear, um, rigid kind of volume language and we wanted to break up the facade because at the moment it looks like a school building or so and we didn't want that we wanted to wanted it to feel a bit more loose um so yeah we also changed the configuration of the bathroom and the bedrooms and we designed the outdoor deck area we added sort of um large format concrete pavers with grass in between and we have an outdoor shower. Yeah, just generally enhance the space. Next. 
So this is what it looks like now with the veranda on the one side. Um, you still access from the bottom, but we also highlighted the entrance with a sort of a, a, a covering overhead. We changed the color of the building. Sometimes that's all you need. Um, yeah, next slide. This image really shows how we would have um, broken up the building. So you can see the veranda and you can see the additional um, bedroom space, which also creates a cover for the deck space for the studio apartment below. Um, even though we would have brought out these volumes, we still wanted to add a difference in materiality. So we have those stone kind of columns and we added a bit of timber texture because the, the current owner does um, he does quite a bit of boating and sailing, so he did want a bit of timber element in there. Next. Another view from the back, we added a veranda to one of the bedrooms at the back and a covering um, also to loosen up this very rigid facade. Next. And this is now the back area, even this facade with the pergola that we've added, it um, is not as, as, as harsh. Next. So then I come to this project and this was probably our most challenging project for the year. And I'll explain why, um, as you can see, beautiful project. Um, it's the site is on a very steep slope. The clients wanted um, one to two bedrooms, but also multifunctional space where they could work, garage space with a workshop. Um, because this site is west facing, we really had to take into the consideration the setting sun, which can be extremely harsh. Um, so um, I'll show you what we would have done next. So this is the site, um, sort of central to the to the um, the photo. It's on a very steep slope. Next, these are the views from the site. It's really, really in a in a very beautiful area, residential area. Next, um, the first challenge that we met was that the site was so steep. Um, they also had a geotechnical survey done, which showed that in the top areas of the site, there was quite a bit of gravel. So you would see where you have sandy gravel, um, clay gravel, and they, they're showing the depth of that. So basically the, the geotechnical survey advised to not build in that area. Um, so the, the brown line shows the natural ground level, and then the dotted gray line shows where the tiff would actually start. So you would have to dig until you get to the tiff in order to, to put the foundation. Next. So in response to that, we um, created a building which was made up of two zones, two volumes. So you have the, the ground floor volume and the first floor volumes. This we then separated into various zones. Um, where uh, we had a central courtyard more or less connecting the two. Um, and within those volumes on the ground floor, you'd have the garage on one side. On the other side, you'd have the living room space and the courtyard. On the top level above the garage, you'd have an extra bedroom, a guest bedroom and an office space. And at the top of the living room, uh, you'd have just a master bedroom and bathroom. And this was done in order to separate the, the owners from their guests. They didn't really want to be on top, live on top of their guests or have the guests live on top of them. So we created that, that separation. Next. Um, all of the volumes have stunning views um, towards the west. You have the sea view um, towards the north. There were mountain views. And we tried to keep the volumes narrow enough so that we can make use of cross ventilation. Also the courtyard was added so that when the sun was setting, you could, um, you would have a shaded area basically 
to sit and still enjoy the view so it's deep enough so that the sun wouldn't come in. Next. So um, as you can see, we placed the building sort of halfway up the site because from the geotechnical survey, we were advised to not move further up. So this was, this was the highest point which um, it was advised to go. Next. Next slide. And on this ground floor, you'll see that the driveway leads straight up into the garage and workshop. And next to the garage, you'd have the main entrance, which is separated from the courtyard by a breeze block wall. So you can kind of look through um, and see what's happening, but it's still closed off. So, and we were also thinking about security so that at night you can close everything off, but you can still sit in the courtyard. Um, and then you'd enter the courtyard, you'd walk through the courtyard in order to get into the open plan living kitchen space. Um, you would then go up the stairs in order to get to the bedroom. Next slide. And um, above the garage, as I mentioned before, you'd have an office space with a kitchenette, bathroom and guest bedroom. And above the living room space, you'd have an open plan bedroom and bathroom. As you can see, all the rooms would have views. Next. Next, please. So this is the outcome of the design. Um, we have sun shading, sliding sun shading elements so that they can be opened up um, in the early morning. And then when the sun is setting, you can close them off just to keep the house as cool as possible. Next. This is another view showing the living room space on the ground floor. You can see that breeze block wall, which really um, goes well with the, the design. It breaks it up a little bit. Um, and generally, we don't use, or I personally don't like using too many materials. So you'll see here, there is a combination of that um, white concrete, um, the timber, the black framed windows and doors and then the breeze block wall. This is another view. Um, the top floor also has um, a veranda space. Next. And this view um, zooms in a bit on the entrance. You can see the stairs to go up to the office and um, separate guest bedroom. So next. So um, I'll go through the client's comments. So they thought that the design was beautiful, but it wasn't for them. Um, they wanted all the living spaces to be on one level. And they additionally wanted a swimming pool and the garage needn't be um, enclosed. So then we started sharing some images to really find out what was their style and what were they looking for. They were looking for something a bit more, um, I, I suppose, like a Caribbean industrial slide, maybe. I'll show you some images and maybe you can <laughs> help, me, um, help me decide what you'd call that style. Um, yeah, in, in addition, I forgot to mention that this project was on a very, very small budget, um, but the clients really knew what they, they wanted. So they had a very long list and, you know, um, as architects, it's our responsibility to let the client know that this does not seem like it would fit within this budget, but we will try our best. Um, with this design as well, there was too much excavation. And as you know, excavation costs money because um, you need to bring the, 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 the diggers on the site. They, they charge you for the hour and then you need to cart it off. So we had to try and excavate as little as possible but still um, work with the brief. So we started over completely, completely, complete new design. Next. So this floor plan was actually provided by the client. They kind of um, cut our floor plan and, and sort of created their new floor plan to show us what they wanted. 
everything on one floor, uh, all rooms should have views to the sea. But as you can see, it doesn't really fit on the site. So we changed it a little bit next. And um, we created, we still use the concept of two different volumes. So one volume is more the public space and the guests. And then the other volume would then be more the private areas. Um, and then these areas will be connected by outdoor deck space and a pool area. Next. Um, this is how it fits on the site. So, you know, nonetheless, it is a steep slope. So some excavation would be necessary. Next. So this is the floor plan. You drive up the hill into the garage. There's an area for, you know, doing some workshopping. There's a storage space. And then you'd go up the stairs and you'd a land on the deck. So you can go to the next one. And yeah, you'd enter onto that, this deck. Um, from that deck, you'd already have views, amazing views of the sea. And then from there, you decide whether you wanted to go into the public areas. So their guests would be led into the open plan living space. Um, or guest bedroom, or they would go into the bedrooms. And as you can see, it's all interconnected. We also made sure that these areas could all be closed off at night. So if you're getting up in the middle of the night, you shouldn't be scared that someone's walking around on the deck space if you wanted to go to the kitchen. Um, and then the pool is in the middle. Next. Yeah, next. So this was what we were now looking at, um, which the clients, the clients really liked this type of design with um, the steel and the timber and the glass. Next. Um, so this is the design we came up with. This is the view from the bottom of the hill. And we showed this view because the clients were very concerned about privacy. Um, and we wanted to show this view that it is a bit, it is quite far away from the road. So privacy would be maintained and, you know, you can still plant trees, which wouldn't disturb the view because the building would be above the trees. Next. And this is what the building would look like head on. You'd have the garage under one side. You'd have the pool. You'd see that um, the pool would have to obviously be built up just because the site is quite steep. So you'd have to build the pool up, which is quite a bit of a cost. So that was something else that needed to be discussed, whether the pool really is necessary and whether it can fit into the budget, whether it can be done differently so it wouldn't be so expensive. Um, you can see we kept the idea of the sliding screens in order to have that sun shading. We have the verandas, so we have deep set, um, deep set verandas so that the rooms would stay as cool as possible. In addition, we have louvers at the top um, of the roof area so that the heat can also escape. Next. This is one view of the building closed off, which is just as beautiful, almost even more beautiful than um, with it opened up. This is one of my favorite shots of the rendering. Next. This is another view showing the two separate volumes connected by the outdoor deck, outdoor covered deck, and then a pergola area over the pool. Next. So the outcome of this was that they actually loved the design, but um, again, you know, we had to say it's probably out of your budget because it is expensive. And I think, you know, that's one of the challenges you face as an architect because obviously everybody has dreams. Everybody has dreams of their dream home. And you are kind of the one sometimes to stamp on their dreams, or you feel like it, like you're stamping on their dreams and bringing them back to reality. Um, so we had to discuss a few of these, 
a few of these things. The garage obviously would have needed to be excavated. So then we had to rethink the location of the garage, whether it should be on the other side and build a platform up. So then it would be floating. Um, also the clients insisted that they wanted the building to be higher up because obviously the higher up you go on the property, the better the views. Um, but then that's the area that's where the gravel is. Um, and um, yeah, the material as well was an issue. So at this point we brought in a quantity surveyor because um, we don't have one in house and we can say it's going to be more expensive, but we can't give an exact figure. You know, um, usually you work per square foot, every, the quantity surveyors would initially work per square foot according to what's your main material use. And we brought a quantity surveyor in at this point to give us an idea of how expensive this design would be. And it ended up being four times the initial budget. So again, we had to completely rethink the design um, and then see, okay, what is possible? You know, back to reality, what is possible within the design? Um, and um, the material wouldn't work because steel prices have gone through the roof um, due to COVID and shipping being difficult. And I don't know about Jamaica, but the import tax in Grenada is very, very high. So the higher your shipping costs, the higher your the cost for the material because the import tax is not only on the price of the material, but also on your shipping cost. So the steel wouldn't have made sense. Um, so back to your, um, the, someone's asking a question, but I'll keep the questions for later on. Um, yeah, back to, you know, concrete, concrete blocks. Um, so next I'll move on to, I don't, I, I'm not going to move on, but I'll just let you know that we, the last st stage for this project was we were on the fourth conceptual design, basically. Um, so from this project, we learned quite a lot. <laughs> we learned that you have to try and get to know your client as much as possible before starting with the design process. Um, we learned that, you know, sometimes you really have to assert yourself and different people have different personalities. Sometimes you have to assert yourself even more. And, you know, because at the end of the day, it comes back to you. You know, um, I think I personally did feel like I didn't tell them enough. It's not within your budget. It's not within you. But I feel like I should have said it every day. <laughs> um, when in doubt, consult other professionals because then, you know, you, it's not just you as a professional saying it, but then you have more professionals saying the same thing um, in case the client doesn't believe you or doesn't want to believe you. Um, specify in a contract how many conceptual designs will be done. Otherwise, you're going to be like us and you're doing four and five conceptual designs. Um, specify how many changes are allowed or when the changes need to stop and try to stay within the allotted time for each project phase because um, obviously, well, in our firm, we charge according to the cost of the project and then it's broken down into various phases. And if a client is still on phase one and has paid one fee, but you, you're extending the time, time is money, you know, and while you're still working on this project, you're making a huge, huge, huge loss. And that's one of the things that you have to think about when you're um, running your own firm, because you have overheads that keep going. You have to pay rent, you have to pay salaries, um, electricity. And at the same time, you do want to improve the office. You want to improve your office space so you can welcome clients into a beautiful space. You want to improve on the type of PCs you have. You want to get plotters and printers so that um, you, you just generally need to grow. And additionally, you don't want to work your staff to death. You know, you don't want to have anybody working in the office until midnight all the time or on weekends. Um, I am an advocate for having a balanced life. So I try to do so and I want to make sure that my staff, they, they have their free time and their family time um, and work is work, and then your private time is your private time, and it doesn't overlap. 
So um, we can go on to the next one. So I'll say thank you. And I'm seeing questions coming in. Next slide. Questions. So. Okay. Um, thanks a lot, um, Irina. As, as the slide suggests, let's open it up for questions. Um, I see two in the chat. Mm -hmm. um, I'd invite whoever asked the questions to come on screen and ask it directly. That's a good well, idea. Let, let me on, let me allow you guys to unmute this. Um, also, if you guys could just raise your hand so a, sort of a queue can form, that would be good. Yeah. Okay. Uh, let me see. I see um, SG23562. I'm not sure who you are, but you, you asked a question. You might ask it out loud. Hi, how are you, Irina? I was just in a noisy environment, so it's, um, I'm unable to be on video as well. But generally, I'm trying to find out. I'm a Grenadian myself, but I live in New York, and I just purchased a piece of property. So for me, uh, what I'm trying to figure out is uh, what will be the typical steps if I wanted to start planning to, to build something for myself, you know, consultation fees, uh, things to consider before. Mm -hmm. So you said you have a property already, right? Yes, I have the land already. Okay, so um, if you have the property already, I would suggest starting to engage with um, an architect or various architects if you want to, um, if you're not sure who you want to use as yet. One thing you will definitely need because Grenada, you hardly have flat land. So my guess is that you'll need a topographical survey. Um, once you've engaged with the architect, you can show them your site and some architects may charge a consultation fee in order to discuss what you're actually looking for. Some won't. So in my case, I don't usually charge a consultation fee. If you just want to get ideas, tell me what you're thinking about doing. Um, we would have a meeting where you would tell me, you know, what exactly you're looking to build. If it's a home, and how many bedrooms, how many bathrooms, how big is it, what are your priorities with the design, and then I would put together a, um, a design services um, proposal. Um, this proposal would then list my fees and the different phases of the project. So um, it's not just that we create a design and that's it. We have a conceptual design, then we'd move on to design development where we take the approved conceptual design and add services. So we design, um, decide on the various materials. We would design, decide on the lighting, the electrical plans, the structural. So then we'll include a structural engineer um, to calculate all the structural systems. And we'll also start including the plumbing. Then we'd move on to preparing the plans um, for planning approval. Um, whilst the plans are um, waiting to be approved, we will continue on the drawings, adding more detail to the drawings. So if you have kitchen, we'll then do kitchen elevations, um, closet elevations. Um, we'll do plans showing each room. So um, room data, they're called room data sheets, where if it's your bathroom, we'll do elevations of the bathroom walls to show which tile you're using, um, start creating specifications so that once we receive approval from planning, you can then use the whole package of documents, the ones from planning and the detailed ones. Um, you can send them out to various contractors um, to get quotations on how much it would cost to build. And then you can decide on your um, contractor and then you could begin. Does that answer your question? It does. Um, and one more thing, uh, as far as a project manager goes for someone that does not reside in Grenada, is mm -hmm. there an additional cost or does your company also provide that? Um, yeah, we do. We are able to do that, but there is an additional cost. Um, that would then be an hourly fee. Um, but there are also project managers that you could use independently from your contractor. So again, you could shop around. Um, it's not necessarily a full-on 
project management role is not necessarily something that we can do it, but um, as an architect, we prefer to definitely check in during construction, but managing in terms of managing money and who gets paid what and so on. So almost taking on a contractor's role, we don't like to do, or I personally don't like to do, because um, it takes away from doing designing and focusing on architecture. But yes, it is something that we can do. And there are project managers on the island that can be hired as well. All right, thank you, uh, thank you so much. We want to prioritize a student question. Um, I'm not sure if Daniela Webley is a student or Karen Peters. But if a student Hi. has a question, please. Ask. Oh yes, hello. Yes, I am. Um, I'm a student. I have quite a few questions, but my first question to you is: um, In assembling your team, did you find it difficult to recruit members for your firm or for your team? Um, how long did it take you to find those team members and how did you go about recruiting them? Okay, so it was not very difficult. Um, so where, while I was freelancing, I worked with Anisha. So I already knew Anisha and funny enough, I actually taught her in school. So um, I already knew her personality. I knew that she was a hard worker. She's focused, you know, she gets it done. Um, which is very important. So when I came back to Grenada and started getting projects, people who knew I came back and reached out to me, I asked Anisha if she wanted to work alongside. Um, and um, I guess the only question there was because she was doing her own work for her, it, she wanted to know, can she continue doing her own work or is it that you know, she can't do anything else. And I'm, I'm quite open and flexible. So that was not a problem. Um, and then projects came in, started coming in quite quickly. So, and Grenada is very small. So a friend of mine said her boyfriend's coming to Grenada. He's, um, he just finished studying architecture and he's looking for a job. So I actually sent her names of architecture firms that he could look into. And then I said, you know what, send, he should send me his portfolio as well. I wasn't sure if I wanted somebody else. Um, but then by the time I met him and a project got confirmed, I said, okay, let's, if you're open, let's do this. Um, the last person to join was Antonia and we really needed um, just additional support because I quickly realized that I... I thought I would be doing more drawing, but in running a firm, you do very little of that. So then needing that extra support. Um, and then I put out an ad on social media and very quickly various people responded, um, met with a few of them. And they also met the rest of the team, Trevor and Anisha. And together we kind of discussed everybody's strengths and um, their weaknesses. And we kind of more or less decided together. Yeah. So really and truly, it wasn't that difficult. Thank you. You're welcome. Great. I see, I see Karen Peters. Uh, hand raised. Oh, yeah. Um, can I go ahead or? Yeah, go ahead. Um, yeah, so hi, I'm an architecture student from Trinidad, but um, I'm studying in Manchester. And I was wondering well, what changes or new ideas do you think like you and your team as mostly women bring to, um, sorry, bring into the field in a traditionally male dominated industry or area? Um, I would say, but this it is, it's not necessarily to this industry in particular, but if you've noticed, we're having more female leaders around the world and females seem to be a bit more compassionate. Um, I have, funny enough, I have one client, he's not on island, um, but he has said that he never wants to deal with men on, in Grenada again. So his lawyer is a female, his architect's a female, um, sorry, sorry guys, I'm not bashing any men, um, but um, it seems like women are a bit more um, compassionate and 
less macho. Um, so we can, I'm, I'm treading carefully here, as you can tell, <laughs> we can, um, what was it that I was about to say? I, I can only speak for, I can speak for myself and Anisha. I've found that we are better listeners than often than men. Actually, Trevor's a really good listener. Let me not say that. Um, we are better listeners. We, we do, we're not very quick to get angry at a situation and start shouting. Um, you know, we take it easy and we take a back step and we listen to, you know, there are situations where you have the contractor and then you have a plumber and then you have the electrician and everybody's talking. And, and then both of us quite often, I don't know if it's a personality thing, we, you know, we listen and then we say, okay, here's what. Um, so maybe egos are less involved in this case, but that could also just be a personality thing. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I hope I answered your question. Bonita, <laughs> yeah. um, do you want to ask the question? Oh uh, yeah, I'll go ahead now. Um, hi, I wanted to ask about um, sourcing materials for construction in the Eastern Caribbean because I'm also from a small island, St. Lucia, and I was wondering, due to the availability of certain materials, does that really hinder your design in terms of it kind of places a more like a burden on the cost of production if you have to import things. So how does that hinder your design process? Um, it hinders it quite a lot. <laughs> um, we're constantly trying to find um, different materials. You know, you'll find the standard stuff here, but anything that is of a better quality um, is, is a bit more expensive. And then also, we're trying to find, we're trying to source things directly from factories instead of buying it from Home Depot or, you know, the, the, the stores in, um, in the U.S. Because we do bring in quite a lot of stuff from the U.S., especially finishes, um, fixtures, anything that is a bit more styled. It comes down to door handles and cupboard door pulls and handles these little things you know you go into the hardware stores here and quite often you have the basic stuff anything that's a bit nicer is sold out very quickly yeah. so it's it's really a challenge and it's something we're constantly dealing with and we're con whenever we see somebody with something the first question is where did you get it from you know who's selling this who's bringing this in um, so it's really about building our portfolio. We do have, I have one person who sources material um, in Trinidad um, who can send stuff up and also one company in my, and they're very good because then we don't pay the tax that you would pay if you buy it straight from the so store. So they're quite good at sourcing things. And then it takes a week and a half to get down via shipping. Um, import tax really kills us. So, um, and, and import tax kills everybody in Grenada. So a lot of the stuff in the hardware stores that are affordable, you know that they bought it at a very cheap price, you know? So the quality is, is a little cheaper, not all the time, but quite a lot of the time. So it really is a challenge. Okay. Thank you. And the other question I wanted to ask is that in a number of your designs, I saw that you took a lot of climatic considerations. Um, is it that your firm also aspires to sustainable design? Is that something that you try to incorporate? Definitely, definitely. It is, um, you know, it also makes for better living and costs are high as it is. If when clients you know, we sort of leave it up to the clients in terms of how far they want to go in sustainable design. But within the design itself, we try to um, incorporate as much as possible. For instance, for the supermarket design, it's actually completely insulated. Um, all the walls are insulated. The roof is insulated. Also because the supermarket, because it's offices and a supermarket, it's going to be enclosed most of the time and air conditioned. So you don't want that cool air to escape because um, that will just increase electricity costs. So we've completely insulated it. 
and um, yeah, take into consideration sun and wind direction. Um, and if a client wants to do rainwater harvesting, the supermarket actually also has rainwater harvesting and um, solar panels on the roof. Okay, thank you. Okay, we're going a bit, um, you know, pretty far out of time. So mm -hmm. in the interest of um, continuing the conversation, I'll say, I'll take three more questions. Okay. Um, okay. I'll take one from the chat. I see Adama Lee, um, L, I'm not sure who. Oh. I have a question. No, you butchered it already. It's the Mali, but it's okay. Oh, sorry. I'm so it's sorry. It's all good. You're oh, fine. Um, no, this was a great presentation. So thank you for putting it on. And thank you, Irina. I just have a quick question. How do you deal with, I mean, you talked about steel. Actually, someone in the chat mentioned potentially using core 10 steel. But how do you protect exposed steel, right? Because you don't want the salt air to damage it. So if the client was insistent on that, how do you protect it? Um, honestly, you know, um, as a material, we would try to coat it with some protective um, paint. Um, but really and truly, you you would need to do that probably every year. Every year, you yeah. need to do touch-ups. You'd probably need to wash your house on a regular basis. And because Grenada is so small and surrounded by the ocean, you were basically on the beach. So um, that's the risk in using that material. You, you have to know that it's like living on a boat. You have to wash it down all the time. And then once a year, you'll need to get somebody to tackle the rust spots and um, re-coat it and then paint over it. Thank you. Um, and uh, I see Hugo Matthews, who's also a, a speaker in Emerging Practice series. Um, I just want to get a question so I just want to highlight that. Okay, thank you. Um Jordan. Hi everyone. Hi Arena. Nice to nice nice to be here and um presentation was really good. Um thank certainly you. enjoyed it and uh, I really do love the style of architecture that you you seem to be practicing there. So different from my style for certain, but I do really appreciate that style. Um a question for you, you know, in the Caribbean um in general. Sometimes it's the agencies and the turnaround time to get those approvals. Um, I think you also mentioned that you've been operating for just over a year. And um, I think um, you said none of the projects are completed as yet. Um, so my question is, in Jamaica, we have normally have to deal with about three agencies in general. And um, that's the normal. Uh, but sometimes it extends to as much as six, depending on the, um, on the complexity of the project. So uh, my question, curiosity, in Grenada, um, how many agencies do you have to deal with um, for, for, for your approvals? And um, how long um, does that usually take? So it's actually one um, agency, um, Physical Planning Authority, that's the name. Within that, they have, um, they have an office that looks over the structural component, then the um, wastewater, and, um, and then the architectural. And um, so structural as well and due to covid and persons um retiring etc it took up to seven months recently to get planning approval but apparently we're getting word that they have hired new staff so they are saying that it shouldn't take more than two months and i think this is also the case because there are quite a lot of foreign investors on the island and they are also complaining and sometimes you need people with money to complain so that all of us can um can get through thank you okay last question i just want to pass it on to a student yeah i'm, um, I'm a student okay, okay go ahead Rolando. <laughs> yeah so um hi arena um i want to thank you for your presentation i'm also a fellow uh, Grenadian uh, studying here in um, Atlanta at the University of Kennesaw State. Um, so the question I have is, um, I noticed in your statement, in the Brandon statement, you talk about incorporating culture. And I was just wondering if you can talk about like what probably are some of the challenges that you might have come up against, you know, with um, traditional colonial colonialism architecture. Um, in terms of the clients wanting that, or just just in terms of the like that culture that that um, 
that is somewhat dominant, you know, not just in Grenada, I guess, but, you know, at the Caribbean? Well, to be honest, um, the good thing about having a private practice is that um, the clients, the clients would have seen the work that is done. And most times they aren't interested in having that type of work done. You know, they want something a bit more contemporary, which still takes into consideration the climatic conditions. So it, it really and truly isn't something that I come across a lot. Um, I haven't done any government projects for, you know, but as I said, once you, you show your work and it, your work is consistent, if I had a project that was all of a sudden of that style, you know, I couldn't blame someone for coming and saying, oh, that's what I want, but we have none of that. And I wouldn't even be good at it. Um, so, so it's not something that we, yeah, we have to deal with. Thank you. All right. Great. So that, that was three. Um, maybe we have room to squeeze in one more question. It is 11 minutes over time and some people might be tired. I want to be aware of that. Mm -hmm. um, so I see Franz Repo, who is a lecturer at the Caribbean School of Architecture. So I just want to bring the academia into mm -hmm. it as well. Oh, thank you, Jordan. Danke für deine Zeit und Thielen, Irina. You're welcome. Um, special regards to Anisha. I haven't connected in a while. Um, I too lectured Anisha. Okay. Um, I don't really have a question. I, I just want to encourage you um, for taking that bold step. I mean, you took it in a very difficult time. Mm -hmm. um, but sometimes you need to be bold in these times in order for you to um, to be successful. So thank you for a very informative lecture. I thank you on behalf of the students as well. I'm sure it was very informative for them. Um, and I just want to wish you all the best. And thank hopefully you very much. Um, we can connect um, sometime in the near future. Thank you. I hope so too. Okay. You're welcome. You're most welcome. Thank you, Jordan, for letting me in or for squeezing me in. <laughs> Jamar, looking out for you too, Mr. Rock. I see you're involved here in, as one of the participants. Yeah, a lot of, a lot of CSA alumni. Yeah, I do. I do. Many of you I taught. Good to see all of you. All right. Um, and with that final question, um, I think I'll close the chat. Um, Bonita, I'm um, offer um, to stay on to continue the conversation. If anyone is okay with that, um, feel free. Yeah. Um, if you guys have other activities to do, also feel free to finish work, finish your assignments. Um, yeah. Thank you for coming, definitely, for the first part of the series. Um, thanks, all the speakers for the other parts of the series for joining this one as well. Um, really appreciate the turnout. Thank you guys. Thank you. Thank you for having me. All right. Um, yeah. If anyone wants to stay on, that's fine. Bonita will um, coordinate the rest. Yeah. Um, I was wondering if um, Daniela and Karen would like to ask their questions quickly. Yes. Um... Thank you. I'm actually a student still in high school. I'm in my last year of high school. So what I wanted to ask was, did you start off this good? I mean, I look at your designs and they're so innovative and creative. And so I'd like to know how you started off and really what life lessons or challenges did you face, especially during your time freelancing? Um, no, I did, definitely did not start off um, like this, and I am, I'm really hoping that um, I grow and that the firm grows. Um, life lessons, quite a lot, quite a lot. Um, I think one of the most important ones was to believe in yourself. Um, that's, that's probably the most important one. 
Um, I think, you know, at university, you doubt yourself. You're constantly being criticized, um, which is for your own good. And you have to see it as such that the, any criticism is meant to allow you to grow rather than to break you down. Um, any criticism you get during your professional life is also meant to allow you to become a better architect. Um, also, you know, I, I think one of my most distinct memories is of meeting someone who was an architect and was very confident, just had that air of, ah, yes, I am amazing. And then I saw their work and I was like, my work is better than that, you know? So, so it, that's why it's so important to believe in yourself and, and hold yourself to that conviction. And even if you don't really believe in yourself yet, like keep telling yourself, I am good. I am really good. I am an amazing architect. And eventually, hopefully you'll become an amazing architect. Um, yeah. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Okay, guys, um, I think Irina has other activities that she you know, yeah. has to do. There's a full day. Um, Irina, really, honestly, thank you so much for doing this. Um, it's really good connecting. Um, thanks so much. Um, yeah. I hope you'll join the other lectures in the series. As well. Definitely, definitely. Yeah, appreciate it. Thank you, guys. Okay. Thanks, everyone. Have a good um, evening, everybody. I just wanted to say that on behalf of the Caribbean Architectural Students Association, we'd like to thank you, Irina, for coming out and giving this lecture. It was really informative, and we hope that persons who came out today enjoyed it and they can continue to attend the next two upcoming lecture series. So, yeah. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Thanks, guys. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Thank you.